the title of our series it's called the dawn of an era everybody say the dawn of an era our talk title for today is this listen up are you listening talk one is called tough and gentle can you say that tough and gentle I don't know about you but that's not, that's the kind of person I want in my life somebody who is tough who will tell you the truth in front of your face and tell you for what it really is but you see a lot of people are tough and they tell you the truth but there are also people who are mean that's why you don't want just a tough person you want someone who is tough and gentle someone who will tell you the truth but also have the compassion to love you after they correct you right how many of you want tough and gentle people around you that's what we're going to talk about today so are you ready yes. all right let's say our favorite family prayer today in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen everybody stretch your hands out all the way until you hear some muscles cramp here we go. Everybody say, today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to the book of Matthew? We're reading Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. They're going to put it up on the screen just in case. It's going to be a bit lengthy, but you know, this is the first time we're going to be doing this at the feast. What we're going to do for the next six to seven weeks is we're going to take one piece of passage, one piece of scripture, and then we're going to use that for the entire six or seven weeks. And the beautiful thing about reading God's Word is that every single time you read it, God will tell you something new, something fresh. Are you ready for something fresh today? Okay, here we go. Let me read it from Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. It says that in those days, everybody say in those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. So you see, this scripture talks about John the Baptist. And some of you might not know this, but John the Baptist happens to be the cousin of Jesus. Okay, just to get that trivia out of the way. And John's message was this. He said, repent of your sins and turn to God. Would you tell that to the person on your right? Repent of your sins and turn to God. For the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. And John, John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his wa waist. For food, he, check this out, he ate locusts and wild honey. And people from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, everybody say confess. He baptized them in the river Jordan. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees come in and watch him baptized, he denounced them and said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Prove by the way that you have lived that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, We're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham, because that means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Here's my big message for you today. Are you ready? God's message for you today is receive His mercy. Receive His mercy. Every head bowed down, eyes closed. 
Father, this is your word. We thank you so much for the message that you are about to speak in our life. We don't know what it is yet, but we are just leaning in. Leaning into your presence, leaning into you. Speak to us, Lord, in a personal and powerful way. Let this speak a word that we need to practice in our life in the next few days. In Jesus' name, amen. One more time, everybody lift your hands in honor of God's word and let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Give the Lord a big hand, everybody. Matthew chapter 2 and John the Baptist. Everybody say John the Baptist. His message Repent of your sins and turn to God. Verse 2. Repent of your sins and turn to God. Not a very popular message. Yes or no? Not very popular today. I mean, hello? When was the last time somebody says, repent and turn? You know, we'd rather hear the message, you're okay. I'm okay. We're okay. You know, we, we like those comforting messages but not repent but you know what we're going to do at the feast ask me what for four Sundays we're going to be talking about repentance what yes we're going to talk about repentance specifically we're going to talk about how do you call someone to repentance how do you call a family member to repentance how do you call a friend to repentance how do you do that we're going to talk about the four platforms everybody say platforms you, we're going to talk about the four platforms by which you need to stand on when you call people to repentance. And we're going to talk about the first platform today. And the first platform is, ask me what? Mercy. You've got to call people to repentance from a place of mercy. And John the Baptist, he called people to repentance. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that time, they also called people to repentance. But... When John the Baptist would call people to repentance, thousands would repent. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they called people to repentance, very few would. And one of the reasons is that John the Baptist would, would call people to repentance from the place of mercy. One more time, say mercy. mercy. Tell somebody beside you, receive his mercy. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Why it's so difficult for us, very uncomfortable, when somebody calls and says, repent. It's like, we're very uncomfortable. We really, it's, you know, we, we, we want people, we want people to tell us, you're okay, I'm okay, we're okay. We, we, we'd rather hear that message. But recently, I was talking to a, 27 year old guy drinking too much like every day wasted cheating on his girlfriend I was talking to him and his girlfriend and, 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 and the girl was just crying her eyes out he was cheating on her uh, throwing away his career because of his drinking addicted to pornography could not stop he was basically a 27-year-old guy who was throwing his life away. What do I tell him? You're okay. I'm okay. We're okay. No! That would be the worst thing to tell him. What should I tell him? Fix your life. Change. You're destroying yourself. Am I speaking to somebody here? Basically, I need to tell him, you know, come to Jesus. You know, he loves you. I need to give him the call of repentance. It's like somebody is walking on the road, reading his phone. How many of you do that sometimes? So you're walking and looking at your phone. And then there's a manhole in front of you. And you're about to fall. No, let, let, let's say you're, you're there somewhere at the sidewalk. And you're seeing this guy reading his phone while walking and there's this open manfold and you know that if he goes through it, you're, he's going to break his neck. What are you going to do? Stand beside him and read the phone with him? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Read the phone. Come on, come on, read the phone. No, 
follow you. You say, stop. You know, the, the reason why I believe we have a very difficult and awkward and uncomfortable time with this whole idea of repentance, ask me why. We do not know how to give the message of repentance. We don't. And the reason is because we've got bad experiences in receiving that call of repentance. Can I tell you my story? When I was 12, 13 years old, I did not like to go to confession. Are there some people here who, have, who, who didn't like to go to confession when they were young? I didn't like to go. Ask me why. Because in one of my first confessions, I had to go to my parish priest who was German and who was 81 years old and who was a little bit deaf. And he shouted at me in my confession and it was traumatic. And, and, and I didn't want to go back. You know when it's traumatic, you can't forget, right? So I can't forget that moment when I, when I entered that confessional box. I was 12 or 13 years old, knelt down. And then the, the little window, the little wooden sliding window opened. And, and my, my, I could hear my, my heart beating. <sighs> Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And my sins are... And gee, I, I was so ashamed to tell my sin, you know. And so I, I, I whispered, pornography. And, 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 and the priest, you know, he was hard of hearing. What did you say? <laughs> I had to make, speak louder. Pornography, Father. You know, really nervous. What did you say? Still didn't hear me. I had to speak louder. Pornography, Father. He still could not hear me. He said, adultery. <laughs> no, no, Father. Pornography. Pornography. And, 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 and I was thinking, you know, the whole church heard it already. But <laughs> I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. You know, I, this is this, but this is the truth. I, I left that confessional box terrified of my parish priest. And also terrified of my angry God. Like, like this was the image of God that he was giving to me, that God was angry. And repentance has got to do with these two things. Usually, number one, God is angry at you that you need to repent. And number two, you're awful. That's why you need to repent. God is angry and you're awful. The two messages of repentance. But I want you to know that repentance, real, how many of you want to change? How many of you want to really change? How many of you want real long-term change? Everybody say, I. I. Louder, I. I. If you want real, true, honest to goodness, real change, it cannot be through shame. It cannot be through even anger separated from love. It, the only thing that can change a person, ask me what? It's mercy. Only the mercy of God can change you. Tell somebody beside you, only the mercy of God can change you. That, that's the only thing. Not, not, not shame, not, not, not even guilt. All of the, no, it's, it's got to be the mercy of God that can change you. John the Baptist. We imagine John the Baptist to be a uh, to be an angry guy. Do you have that imagination in your mind? After all, he, he, he you know, who, who wore camel's hair and, you know, and a, and, and a leather thing and, and he was living in the desert and he ate locusts and, and then he, uh, <laughs> he, he, he called the Pharisees, you brood of snakes! It's like, whoop! Would you want John the Baptist to be your feast builder? And this is scary, right? Like, woo. He's. And so a lot of people think that John the Baptist is tough and then Jesus is gentle. But when you read the Gospels, it's not true. John the Baptist and Jesus were both tough and gentle. Can I prove it to you? Jesus, he was tough to the Pharisees as well. Chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus used the same exact words that John the Baptist used. Went to the Pharisees and said, you brood of snakes. Verse 27, 10 verses before that, he said, you whitewashed tombstones. Two chapters before, chapter 21 in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus enters a temple with a whip, overturns the tables. So angry, especially at the Sadducees who were operating that market because of the corruption going on. So he was very tough. Everybody say tough. Jesus was very tough to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But 
Everybody say, but. He was very gentle to the Samaritan woman who had five husbands, to the adulterous woman on John chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery, brought by the Pharisees, very gentle there. He was very gentle to Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, the one who stole and was corrupt. Jesus was very gentle to him. Jesus was very gentle to the criminal, the criminal that was hanging on the cross beside him. Am I making sense to you? Here's the point. Here's the point. When Jesus called the proud, everybody say proud. When Jesus called the proud to repent, he was tough. But for everyone else, Jesus was gentle. And, and because of this, I, I want you to know, I want you to know that you need discernment. Everybody say, I need discernment. What does the person in front of you need? Because both John the Baptist and Jesus were, they, they were both tough and gentle. They knew when, when a person needs tough love and when a person needs gentle love. Love is both tough and gentle. And so if you want to grow in love, you need to grow in wisdom on, on what the person needs. And is John the Baptist gentle? Doesn't seem like it. Can I prove to you that he is also gentle? May I? Matthew quoted from Isaiah. He did. He really did. He said, in, he said John, in the Gospel of Matthew, he said, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, it was a quotation from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. Two Sundays ago, I said that when Matthew quotes from the Old Testament, he's not only quoting one sentence, he's quoting the entire section because he assumed that his readers, the Jews, you knew your Bibles. Since you were kids, you knew your Bibles. And so when, when, when Matthew would quote one verse from the Old Testament, he was quoting not, not, not just that one verse, he was quoting the entire section. And so this was just one verse, that this is only verse 3 of chapter 4 of the, God, of, of the prophet Isaiah. Do you know what verse 1 and verse 2 was? You're not interested? You want to know what it was? It's amazing. It is not the angry scary, hairy John the Baptist. No. In verse 1, Isaiah says, Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Am I, am I making sense to you? Do you know when God, do you know when Jesus is harsh and tough to the proud, the Pharisees, the Sadducees who didn't want to look at their sins and he was tough. But to those who already knew they were sinful, Jesus was gentle. I don't know about you, but I don't want the tough, harsh love of God. I want the gentle one. And if you want the tough and harsh, you, know, like you want Jesus to be harsh on you, then that's up to you. But be proud. Go ahead, be proud. But I, I don't want that. I, I, want to be, I want to humble myself before God. And I want to say, Lord, I need, your, I need your mercy. I really need your mercy. I want to lead you in repentance today. Um, I'm going to call you to repent. Come and repent. My dear friends, what do you need to repent from? I tweeted this some weeks ago, and I want to show it to you. IG, Facebook, Twitter, send it to 22,000 likes. I, sent, I said, is it destroying you? Give it up. Love yourself. Allow in your life only the stuff that makes you better. I noticed that when, when, when the, I received the comments, they, they said, yes, Brother Bo, I'm giving up my toxic boyfriend. And so it works, it works. That, 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 it, it's, you can apply that in that way. 
But for those who were ready and those who were in that, in the, in this, in that right position, the right situation, they heard me call them to repentance. Because what is destroying you? Put your hands over your chest, please. This is serious. Ask that question to yourself. What is destroying me? Louder. The thing that destroys us the most is sin. Yes or no? That's why God does not want you to do it. Because it will destroy you, it will harm you, it will steal your joy, it will destroy your future. Whatever it is, selfishness, greed, pride, lust, resentment, addictions, anything that destroys you, anything that makes you a lower person, lesser person, that's sin and destroys you. So, I'm calling you to repentance. Let's, let's only accept the stuff that will make us a better person. And anything that's destroying us, let's renounce today. You can't do it on your own. You need His mercy. And so we're going to ask for God's mercy. Are you excited? Are you excited to repent? Are you sure? It's beautiful to repent. It's amazing. It's liberating. How many of you were honestly shocked and devastated to hear about the death of Kobe Bryant? Raise your hand. I think this is a question that we're going to probably ask ourselves for a long time. Where were you when you found out that Kobe Bryant was dead? And for most of you, you were probably asleep when that happened. You were snoring and dreaming. But for me, it was very different. Because when I found out that Kobe had died, I was sitting in an airplane that just landed in Manila at 4.30 in the morning. See, I had come from, the reason why I wasn't here last Sunday was I was in a retreat in Indonesia with other, other, other fellow builders. And we had just landed in Manila. We left Indonesia at 1 a.m. And we landed at 4.30. And I remember it like it was just last week because technically it was just last week. And I was sitting in, my, in that airplane seat. We were rolling in the tarmac, waiting to get off when John Seelan, the builder of Feast Makati Salcedo, while holding his phone, he turns to me and he says, Pare, patay na si Kobe. And I don't know if it was my, my sleepiness because I barely slept a wink or my drowsiness, but I gave the most logical answer that everybody probably gave out. Where? Because, you know, we, we're exposed to fake news all the time, right? We read about it. We see it. I don't, I don't even know how many times Jackie Chan has died. Like maybe over a hundred times. He's got a hundred lives. But Jackie Chan is still alive and kicking because it's fake news. But you know what I did? As soon as I heard that, I picked up my phone and checked. And every official site said the same thing. CNN, NBC, CBS, TMZ. Same headline. Kobe Bryant dead from helicopter crash. And that's when it sank in me. And I thought, my gosh, what a loss. I mean, Kobe was one of my idols growing up. And you know, the fact that Kobe was only 41 years old, that's my same age. So the second thought that, that, that popped into my head was, thank God that I found out and I read about this news when we already landed in Manila. Because can you imagine having to go through the motions, having to ride a four-hour trip from, from Bali to Manila with that thought in your head, knowing that you're in an aircraft in the sky and somewhere in the world, an aircraft fell from out of the sky? Even the smallest bump that I felt in my seat, I was praying the rosary, calling every saint that I knew of. It's, it's, it's just, it really, it really broke me. But let me jump to another, I'm going to go back to that point in a bit. I want to share this story with you. It's found in the book of Luke, chapter 23. Some of you probably know this story. It's very, it's very Easter. This is the time when Jesus was hanging on the cross and there were two thieves beside him, the one on the right and one on the left. And the story goes is that, verse 39, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed and said, so you're the Messiah, are you? 
Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested and said, Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Three elements that I see in this story of how God's mercy works. First thing that you always need to do is there needs to be acceptance. Everybody say acceptance. There has to be an acceptance of your sins, of, your, of the things that you did wrong, that you offended God. This is what the thief was saying when he said, don't you fear God. Even when you have been sentenced to die, he knew it was, he was going to die. He had been sentenced because he was acknowledging right before Jesus that he did something wrong. And the second step when it comes to God's mercy is after there is acceptance, now there needs to be repentance. Everybody say repentance. Repentance is when this man says, we deserve, everybody say deserve. We deserve to die for our crimes. And then he goes on by saying, Jesus, remember me. It was short of saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. But please don't forget about me. I need your mercy. Remember me. And here's the last part. After there is acceptance and after there is repentance, then it's possible for God to give you his deliverance. Everybody say deliverance. Jesus says this, he says, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was giving his mercy and his love and he was saying, from now on, you're with me. So I want you to think about in your own life today, which stage are you in? Are you in the acceptance stage? Or maybe you're not even in that stage yet. You're not acknowledging your sins. You don't know what you did wrong. You got to get to that first part. And then after that stage, what is your stage now? Are you in the repentance stage? Are you going to confession? Are you coming before God and coming back to God and admitting your mistakes and then saying, Lord, I'm going to try to change this with all my heart. And only then you will be able to receive God's mercy and God's deliverance. Is this helping you? Going back to Kobe. Would you like to know one of the last things that Kobe and his 13-year-old Gigi did before they boarded that helicopter ride. Would you like to know? They, uh, some of you might have heard this, but they attended Mass. They went to Mass and, and they had communion. See, Kobe was Catholic. Gigi was Catholic. His family was Catholic. And they attended this parish called Our Lady of Our, of Our Queen of Angels in California. And it's so amazing, so beautiful to think that and to know that the parish priest testified that he saw Kobe and his daughter go to mass and receive communion so in other words Kobe went to God's house and they communed with him I think one of the reasons why we found this story this development so shocking was number one is because it was very tragic in the sense that you know nine people boarding a helicopter and crashing one was even a whole family and then the other reason is because it's too sudden, right? Like it was quick. If you think about it, Kobe Bryant, 41 years old. I'm 41 years old. Anything can happen to me. That's what it's saying to me. I mean, I could walk out of this place and get hit by a bus or a car. I don't have a helicopter. Do you have a hel helicopter? You're not going to ride a helicopter after mass, right? <laughs> I'm saying that anything can happen. And you realize that... If, if somebody like Kobe Bryant, somebody who had great purpose, somebody who had great talent, somebody who had big dreams for his family, if he could just be plucked out from this world just like that, how much more are you and me? And, and somehow you realize that we're nothing but flesh and bones. <laughs> we're just flesh and blood. But here's the thing. We're not just flesh and blood. We're also spirit and soul. Right? So when the body does, you still live. Your spirit still lives. And we're talking about mercy right now. You know what? You want to know what mercy is? Here's my little simple analogy. If you are sick, what do you need? Medicine, right? But if your soul is sick, what do you need? 
you need mercy. So in other words, mercy is the medicine of the soul. Mercy is the medicine of the spirit. When you feel that your spirit is languishing, maybe it's because you need mercy in your life. You know, when nine of those people who boarded that helicopter ride climbed aboard, they had no idea that it was the last time they were going to see their loved ones. They had no idea that it was the last time their feet would ever touch solid, dry ground. Had no clue. And somehow that, that changes you. It changes you because you realize that tomorrow is not promised to any of us. No. No. Not for Kobe, not for Gigi, not for the seven other victims, not for the victims of this virus, not for the victims of the bushfire, not for the victims of, of any calamity, not for the people that you lost along the way in your journey. Not a single moment is promised to you and me. And the book of Proverbs says something very wise. Listen to this. It says, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what tomorrow will bring. That's good advice because not a single second is promised to you and me. And so you know what this does to you? What this does to me is that it teaches us to live with more gratitude in our life. How many of you want to live with more gratitude? Live with more thankfulness in your heart. You know, here's my piece of advice. Stop being petty. Can you tell that to your neighbor? Stop being petty. Come on, somebody needs to hear this. Stop being petty. You need to learn how to let go of the small offenses in your life. Come on. How many of you know I'm preaching the truth? You need to learn how to forgive and be forgiven in return. You need to learn how to receive mercy and then give mercy. Why? Because life is short. Life is short, my friends. So Kobe, even in his last moments, he showed us something great. He shows us the way it's done is that you always keep coming to God. You always keep coming back to God. You always keep communing with God. See, the amazing, amazing promise in the Bible in the book of Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne with confidence, why? So that we can receive His mercy. We have the ultimate right and authority to approach God every single time. Not with fear, not with doubt, but it says with confidence so that we can receive His mercy. We can receive His forgiveness. You see, in God's kingdom, there is no shortage of grace. There is no shortage of, of forgiveness. There's no shortage of mercy. And it's available to anyone who asks and seeks for it. And maybe it's only a matter of making a decision. It starts when you make a decision to say to yourself, I'm not gonna let anything stop me from coming back to my God. I'm not gonna let anything keep me away from God. So bitterness, you can't stop me. Hurt, you can't stop me. Depression, you can't stop me. Come on. Insecurity, you can't stop me. Pain, you can't stop me. Past, you can't stop me. Shame, you can't stop me. Sin, you can't stop me. I cannot promise that I will never ever sin, but I can promise that I will never ever let my sin keep me from my Savior. Come on. Keep coming back to God. Keep coming back to God. You don't know how much time you have left. You, you don't know how many days you got left. Just keep coming back to God. Here's the crazy promise in the Bible. It says that God's steadfast love, it never ceases. It never ends. It never quits. It never gives up. It never runs dry. And here's the next promise. His mercies, they are new every morning. Every single day you get a fresh 24 every day. Fresh grace, fresh hope, fresh love, fresh encouragement going to you, flowing in your heart. So never ever stop coming back to your God because He wants you. 
He's there for you. Everybody lift your hands up in the air. Come on, let me pray for you. Father in heaven, every hand raised up in this place is a representation of a life. Father, you know our hurts. You know our secrets. You know our pasts. But Father, we're ready to move on with you. We're ready to walk in your strength, in your favor, and in your grace. Thank you for giving us this avenue and this channel of opening up and bridging us so that we can have this, this audience with you, Lord. We can approach you with full confidence, knowing that you will not reject us. You will not turn us away, but you will accept us and you will love us for who we are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.